We don't need to do a live, do we? Okay. All right. It is a highly unlikely story. The grandson of prominent rabbis, both sides of the family, baptized Christian, turned atheists, rose to become the prophet of the apocalypse, predicting the violent destruction of Christian civilization with paradise rising from the rubble. And we'll tell you that story, and we'll see how Karl Marx influenced the 20th century and how his influence extends even to today. This is part of our series, The Roots of Liberty, that Jeremiah started. It's a tour that he's been giving us, beginning with Jerusalem, to Athens, to Rome, to, uh, to London, and always with a view of Philadelphia and the American founding, the founding of the American Republic in view. And for the last, for this week, for last week, this week, and the following week, I'm continuing that journey looking at the roots of anti-liberty in Paris with the French Revolution and the thought of Rousseau. That was last week. This week with Marx, the thought of Marx and the revolutionary movements that he spawned in the 20th century. And then next week, we're gonna end with San Diego and I'll just leave that a little mysterious, at least to the end of this talk. Today's lesson, we are in Moscow for the Bolshevik Revolution, which brought Marx's vision of apocalypse. All right, so let's go back to Karl Marx and tell his story a little bit and see how his character and his ideas emerged and the influence that they had. Marx's grandfathers were both, both sides of the family, rabbis of very prominent and ancient lineage. Being a rabbi was like the family business on both sides of his family. Marx, however, was baptized with his family in a Lutheran church. Now, how do you get the, the children of rabbis being baptized with their family well, in, 1860, in 1816, there was the Prussian Decree, which uh, banned Jews from the professions. And that Prussian Decree extended through much of Germany, and Marx's family decided that they would leave their Judaism behind in favor of professional advancement, the opportunity to um, basically become wealthy. Now, uh, Marx's father was caught up in the progressive currents that flowed into and out of the French Revolution, and he was said to have been, said to have known his Voltaire and Rousseau inside out. And he raised Marx to appreciate the thought of Rousseau and Voltaire. And so at some point in his, uh, in his studies, Marx became an atheist. But following the rabbinic tradition of his grandfathers, he was given to study and writing. He earned a doctorate and sought to be a professor, um, but he failed to secure an academic post. So he went into journalism and got involved in radical politics there in Germany following the French Revolution. Uh, Germany, and then he was forced to leave Germany, and he went to France. Uh, in every case, he's part of these revolutionary groups um, who are fomenting revolution, who are getting exiled, and, and so they lead kind of a nomadic existence. He ended up going from Germany to France, from France to Belgium, and he joined the Communist League there in 1848. He wrote their manifesto, the famous, it became the famous Communist Manifesto, um, but after a failed attempt at revolution there, 
in Belgium, in Brussels in 1849. He moved to London where he remained for another 34 years until his death. He, he stayed in London till the end of his life. Now, Paul Johnson, in his book, Intellectuals, which is an excellent book, if you want to read about the radical, uh, the, person, the personalities behind the radical ideas that have swept the world in the last couple centuries, Paul Johnson's book, Intellectuals, is an excellent, very readable uh, resource. Um, Paul Johnson sees three strands in Marx's character and his career. Marx was a poet. Marx was a journalist. Marx was an academic. Let's look at each briefly. Okay, so Marx the poet. Johnson says he was an eschatological writer from start to finish. In this apocalyptic vi vision of an immense impending catastrophe looming over Europe, looming over the existing system, he had that in his mind and his writings from an early age. And what Johnson wants to demonstrate is that this vision preceded his work as a journalist and as an academic before he developed his economic theories. It was an artistic vision in which he sought evidence in subsequent research, trying to prove his vision right, trying to show that that picture in his mind was an inevitability for European and American society. Marx was a journalist. He brought his apocalyptic vision of society to his writing, um, constantly in search of evidence in, in daily stories in Europe and America, evidence of impending social collapse. And he served for over a decade as the European correspondent for the New York Daily Tribune. And today, we wouldn't call him strictly a journalist, but we'd see him more as a pundit because Marx was a gifted polemicist, polemical writer. He was extremely good at pinpointing the weaknesses of, of other commentators in society, uh, other ideas that were current in the day. And through satire and ridicule, um, basically making his own point. He was also, he also had a gift for the pithy turn of phrase. Uh, you've heard workers of the world unite. I mean, that's his legendary, his immortal phrase, but hear how he said it originally. He said, the workers have nothing to lose but their chains. They have the world to gain. Workers of the world unite. And that is a phrase that just catches, yeah? And Paul Johnson said that his, this gift for the pithy phrase, quote, more than anything else, saved his entire philosophy from oblivion. Wow. So there's testament to the power of rhetoric, of the words that one speaks to communicate your ideas. So he was a journalist. He was also an academic. We mentioned that he was actually a failed academic because he never was able to secure a university professorship, but he nevertheless sought academic fame as a grand theoretician. He dreamed of creating kind of this uber philosophy, a philosophy that would make all other philosophies outmoded. And he built upon the work of Hegel, And as he focused his interest, particularly on economics, a philosophy, an economic philosophy, you could see him bringing in that early vision, that early apocalyptic vision that he had um, to his analysis and predictions of economic life and future. 
His academic life, his academic work, elaborated on that vision using, as Paul Johnson says, all the considerable resources of German philosophical jargon and its academic work. So if you've ever tried to read Marx uh, on Capital or the Communist Manifesto, um, it's really uh, rough going, that, that German philosophical, 19th century German jargon uh, runs through it. So that's Marx as a uh, poet, journalist, and academic. As we saw with Rousseau last week, we see also with Marx this week that character is destiny. We saw that with Rousseau. We saw how his character shaped his ideas. His ideas were justification. Uh, they were camouflage for his character. And when Rousseau's ideas came to animate the beliefs of, of men and of political movements, his character flaws became the DNA of the French Revolution. The French Revolution manifested, magnified the flaws of the man whose ideas animated it. And the same is true of Marx. His character flaws characterize Marxism and Marxist movements around this world to this day. So let's take a moment now to see how, all right? And as we look at Marx, one of the foremost thoughts, one of the foremost impressions you gain is a man, a reckless man. And there are three ways that we can discern. The first is Paul is Marx was reckless with money. At the heart of his economic theory was hatred of usury and money lending which was deeply personal for Marx. It was rooted in his own disastrous management of his finances. Marx's life was marred by his gross financial mismanagement, which afflicted his family for decades. His wife, you can see in the family picture here, his wife was from a very noble family in Germany. She had a Vaughn in front of her name. And the wealth that she brought to the marriage was not long before it was squandered. And the proceeds that Marx earned on his journalism career, his writing, his publishing, his books, was all squandered. And his family suffered horribly because of that. Now, instead of hiring a good accountant and following his advice, Marx turned this feeling of failure into animus outward on the free market e economic system that existed in the day. And in particular, he turned it upon Jews, right? So um, though Jewish by birth, Marx hated Judaism and Jews. He focused not just on their ethnicity, but on their religion for his hatred. And what he saw as their worship of the god money. That's how he described them. He believed that this evil idolatry that is within Judaism had spread over the years to Christians, particularly in Western society, to the middle classes, to property owners, industry, free markets, or capitalism, all right? Now that's a term that originated, we think probably in about 1850. And Marx is the biggest popularizer of the term capitalism. Of course, everybody uses it today. All of this he believes sprang from the Jewish practice of money lending. So 
his economic theory, this is what's at the heart of it. Marx's recklessness with money translated into animus toward money lending when combined with his poetic vision of the coming apocalypse, Marx's character shaped a revolutionary ideology that has proven to be uniformly anti-Semitic and destructive of personal property ownership everywhere it is put into practice. And with that driving force behind it, Marx's academic work in economics became an exercise in coercing evidence to fit his ideas. All right, so with, with this animus as a driving force, Marx was also reckless with facts. A big part of Marx's appeal, his philosophy, his economic theory, a big part of his appeal among intellectuals has been his claim to be scientific in his approach. Now, what we've seen already about his character makes one wonder, like, uh, well, how scientific is he really? And his, his academic methodology, as we'll see here in a minute, shows him to be anything but scientific, all right? First, he was desk bound. Though he claimed to speak for workers and uh, social theories that explain everything about industry and property, about economics and government, about agriculture and urban life, Marx seldom ventured from his library desk. There's no evidence that he ever visited a textile mill or a mine or a rural farm. He never interviewed workers or owners or investors or bankers, all the people that he claimed to speak for and against. He was desk bound. Everything he knew about the world of economics and politics, for those last decades of his life, he gathered from books and archives. He also practiced the selective use of facts. Now, it's clear that Marx had already reached his conclusion about banking, industry, economics in the 1840s. All of the ideas that would later be elaborated in his writings were already developed then. All that remained for him to do was to find the facts to substantiate what he already knew to be true. And an analysis was done by two Cambridge scholars in which they went through every one of Marx's writings and they looked up every work that he cited, every quotation, every footnote, every reference from, from external sources. And what they showed is that he was very selective in, in his use of the, of the information in those sources, cherry picking what fit his narrative and systematically ignoring what didn't fit. Their study also revealed that he frequently falsified quotations so where you change the words that are inside the quotation marks, all right? That's a big no-no. That he deliberately and systematically distorted the point being made in the sources that he used. It amounted to what one of these scholars called an almost criminal recklessness with the use of authorities, which is probably why Marx never was able to gain an academic post because in the university faculty, they care about such things. So, scientific, scientific socialism, 
Well, maybe not so much. You know, at heart, Marx was a moralist, filled with a, bur with a burning desire to create a better world. And that vision, rooted in hatred of the current society, which he viewed as subject to a Jewish conspiracy, motivated him to falsify facts in pursuit of a higher truth. That's what he was after. And it also motivated him to seek power and to advocate violence to make a more just world. All right, so that brings us to our third way in which Marx was reckless. He was reckless with power. Marx showed a strong appetite for power, a taste for violence. You see that in his dealings with his family, with his associates in the different uh, revolutionary groups that he traveled among. You see it in his writings, a frequent advocate for revolutionary movements in the mid-1800s, Marx supported their use of violence, terrorism, in pursuit of radical change in society. He was explicit about it. And not only those explicit statements, but his writings also, Paul Johnson says, exude a sense of pent-up rage, a tone of intransigence and extremism shot through his writings. And in due course, Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, they practiced on an enormous scale the violence which Marx expressed from his heart and which his works exude. And so looking at the 20th century, the unvarying violence of Marxist regimes are, is, has been, a projection of the man himself. So can you see how his recklessness with money, with facts, with violence, how the, those characteristics have lived on in Marxist movements and regimes ever since? You see it in the poverty that always follows Marxist revolutionary, the revolutionary ideology, the, the implementation of his economic theories result in poverty and servitude for mass populations, the squandering of wealth, the star mass starvation. You see it in the propaganda, the, the recklessness with facts, the propaganda that always accompanies these regimes. In fact, the invention, in, in fact, of the big lie. So it was, it was the Soviets, it was the Nazis, it was other revolutionary movements around the world who have invented mass-scale propaganda. The propagation of flagrant lies and the subjugation of whole populations to them. And then, of course, recklessness with power and the violence. The number of people murdered you know, in the Russian Revolution. Well, we'll see this in a minute. Um, 12 million people, Russians, were, were, were murdered in a Russian Revolution in the name of creating a better world. 100 million people killed in the 20th century by Marxist regimes. So let's take a look at how his ideas took shape in history. Let's trace the various mutations that his theory underwent along the way. All right, so let's take a look at a century of revolution here. All right, so the core, the core animating idea of Marxist thought was the inevitable collapse of existing society. Now, ever the grandson of rabbis, Marx the prophet, prognosticated in 1848 
that in the next European war, the working class, the proletariat, as he called them, would unite, would seize power from the owner class, what he called the bourgeoisie, and usher in a reign of collective equality, socialism. He called it socialism. Now, when the First World War came around, Marxists thought, here it is. But history proved otherwise. Instead of sparking revolution by the underclass, the war strengthened the bonds between the underclass and the upper class. It strengthened the bonds of national kinship between the classes, uniting them together against rival nations. So the, the underclass, in the name of their nation, fought with the upper class. They died in the trenches of World War I by the millions to defend their nation against others. So from that faith-shattering experience, Marxists had to rework Marx's, Marx's original theory to adapt to this new reality. So Marxism mutated into four new forms. The first was Lenin's. Lenin thought that Marx put too much faith in the proletariat. He said if the revolution depended on their effort, the peasants, inevitable would never come. He said the people need a radical intellectual vanguard to use agitation and propaganda to radicalize them, to spur them, even terrorize them to take collective revolutionary action. You have to coerce the proletariat to act in their own self-interest. And he and the Bolshevik party in Russia did just that. A hundred years ago, back uh, in 1917, we just had our centennial anniversary of, of that faithful uh, movement when the people didn't vote the way they should. You see, just for a little bit of background, for several years before the Bolsheviks took over, there had been some attempts at democratic reform to create uh, elective bodies that would have some legislative power, of which the Bolsheviks were a part. The Bolshevik party, Bolshevik is a Russian word for majority. And um, the day came in an election in, in October of 1917 when the majority, the Bolsheviks, lost the election. And in response, they resorted to violent revolution. They seized power. They went, captured the parliament building there in St. Petersburg. They captured the radio station. They captured the police station and the port. All the centers of power in St. Petersburg, they seized and um, and they spread their ideology, they spread their, their violent uh, takeover outward from there in a revolution that ended up killing millions of Russians over the next five years. Mostly the people who died were the proletarians who were insufficiently re receptive to the dictatorship of the proletariat. That's Lenin's mutation. You need a radical vanguard to, to spur the proletariat to take power. The second mutation was Mussolini's in Italy. Mussolini was an orthodox Marxist in his early years. And in the early 1920s, he learned in World War I that people were more loyal to their nation than to their class. So he recast the mindset of Marxism away from the proletariat to the nation. We need to focus on the nation, the national identity, the national collective as our base of power. So he rebranded his communism, which was symbolized by the workers' hammer and sickle, class symbols, into what he called fascism using uh, a, the new symbol was a bundle of sticks 
surrounding an axe bound together collectively by the all-powerful state which embodies the will of the nation, the fascist fascism. Fascism envisioned the same utopian future as communism and the same revolutionary way of getting there and the same totalitarian means of governing once you get to utopia. They also shared the same enemy as communism, which was the Christian church, which was the uh, effort toward constitutionally limited government, governance and Capitalism, the enemy, Jews. That is Mussolini's mutation, fascism. The third mutation was Hitler's. Hitler was strongly influenced by Marxism in his early years. And Hitler's vision of collectivist loyalty came to be defined not as Uh, class, not as nation, but by race. Building on Darwin's idea of the survival of the fittest, Hitler envisioned the dominance of the Aryan race over all others. He believed that socialism, and he was a socialist, could only work, number one, if the Jews were exterminated, and number two, if all lesser races were enslaved by the Aryans. He believed in the same revolutionary way of getting there, the same totalitarian means of establishing it, and he had the same enemy. The the enemy of that glorious future was Christianity and the culture that is shaped by it, the Western culture uh, with its emasculating ethic of selfless love Capitalism, which, of course, he viewed as a Jewish conspiracy, just as Marx did. And against these, uh, Hitler's nationalist, National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazi Party, instigated violent revolution and totalitarian one-party rule to create a racially pure socialist utopia. That was Hitler's mutation of Marxist thought. Now we come to the fourth, and this was after World War II. The fourth mutation was Marcuse's. Oh, here's Marcuse, so who's this guy? Well, he, Herbert Marcuse, and his colleagues in the Frankfurt School pinpointed culture rather than class or nation or race as the critical factor in fomenting a Marx-inspired revolution. All right? Marcuse, the Frankfurt School, their approach to culture and Marxist revolution was gradual and covert, a slow-motion revolution instead of marching in the streets and taking power as Lenin, Mussolini, and Hitler had. You see, he realized that in prosperous Western democracies in Western Europe, during the post-war years in the United States and North America, that that wouldn't work there. You have to take a much more subtle approach. And so their approach was to do a march through the institutions, the long march through the institutions that shape culture in these Western European and American lands. You gotta get into academia, you gotta get into law, you gotta get into media and entertainment, corporations, professional sports, education, government organizations, you got to seep into these organizations. And by gradually turning these organizations to serve the rhetoric, the propaganda of, of cultural revolution, you could gradually condition people of all classes, 
to accept the gradual imposition of Marxist ideology. Now, of all these four mutations, we all are very familiar with Lenin and Mussolini and Hitler. Um, why don't we know Herbert Marcuse in the Frankfurt School? Well, it's because this Marxist mutation has not yet been defeated. Unlike the others, it is still actively pursuing its revolutionary aims. It's an ideology that prefers not to be named. It refuses to name itself. Back in the 1960s, it was called the New Left. In the 1980s, it became multiculturalism. 90s, political correctness. Today, we hear talk of intersectionality, social justice warriors, wokeness. In academic circles, it's known as cultural Marxism. Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms. You see, Marxists in the Western world figured out that, uh, that the prosperity and the stability, the political um, wholeness of Western societies, these nations, blinded the working class to their true interest. And it would be impossible to radicalize the proletarians because they all have like union memberships and uh, pensions and uh, single family houses in the suburbs. They are saving for their children's college uh, in the future. Uh, these are not people that you're gonna get to march in the streets to, to burn down the system because they have good lives. Because they're content and prosperous. So Marxists had to find new victim groups to radicalize. And toward that end, they began a series of studies in prejudice. This is back in the 1950s, early 60s, which argued that every aspect of bourgeois Western society is based on prejudice. It's all trying to veil its corrupt use of power in pursuit of its prejudice. And so these studies in prejudice relentlessly criticized and analyzed uh, using what maybe you've heard of as critical theory, like critical race theory, to, to subvert the uh, the principles that dominate our society. These studies provided the intellectual basis for the, base, for the various uh, studies departments that we now have in our college campuses. You know, um, uh, women's studies, race studies, gay, LGBTQ studies, um, which seek to advance that critical theory um, and so we're out of time for today's session, but we'll rejoin next week, having had that little taste of this fourth mutation. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go from Moscow today to San Diego next week. Uh, San Diego is where Herbert Marcuse served as a professor in the UCLA San Diego. And we're gonna see uh, his, his life, thought, and how his influence extends today. I mean, we see it marching in our streets. We see it every night on the news. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Josh, for recording. See you next week. <laughs>